right, thank you everyone for coming and supporting our seniors today. I look around and while they might not recognize it yet, today is actually a celebratory today. Celebrating lots of hard work and dedication that has been going on for a year. The students have been working on their projects for a year. That is a long time. Um, for those who don't know, it started in the uh, spring of last year with students piloting some ideas and testing them and then writing a proposal and then executing the work this, this fall. Um, so they've been working on these projects for a long time and they are the experts on, on their work. So I know we all stand to learn a lot from them. I'm proud of all of you. You have all worked so hard over the last, over the last year. So congratulations. Today really is celebratory of the work, um, of the work that you've accomplished. So we have a schedule to stick to, um, and so we're gonna do our best to stick, to stick to it. So our first guest speaker, our first speaker is Emma, who's gonna talk to us about brine shrimp in triclosan. Thank you, Emma. Can you hear, okay. Sorry, okay. So my senior research project was looking at the effects of the chemical agent triclosan on the growth activity and pigmentation of the brine shrimp Artemia salina. Triclosan is an antimicrobial chemical found in pharmaceuticals and personal care products, also known as PPCPs. These products include soap, hand sanitizer, dish soap, toothpaste, mouthwash, kind of the everyday household products a lot of us use that you guys may not realize have harmful chemicals in them. Wastewater treatment plants often don't remove the entirety of triclosan and they can often find their way into aquatic environments. The accumulation of triclosan in aquatic environments has been known to cause effects to multiple organisms such as mosquito fish, zebra fish, copepods, bullfrogs, and brine shrimp. The effects of triclosan on organisms are DNA, DNA damage, enzyme activity alteration, and the delayed hatching and development of uh, organisms. The most common effect of triclosan is it suppresses the enol acyl carrier protein reductase, which inhibits the process of lipid, synthes lipid synthesis and in turn affects the cell structure and uh, function of organisms. The brine shrimp Artemia salina is used as an indicator species because it's known to undergo physiological changes when under stress. They are advantageous because they have a high reproduction rate, a short life cycle, they have minimal feeding during the developmental stages, and they can adapt to various environmental conditions. They also have a low cost, wide availability, and an ease of culture. They're used in approximately 90% of toxicity testing and are used by the US Environmental Protection Agency as a model organism and therefore are very reputable. So the objective of my study was to determine the sublethal effects of triclosan on the morphology and physiology of Artemia salina. The questions I aimed to answer was, does triclosan inhibit the growth rate and movement of A. salina? Does triclosan influence the pigmentation of A. salina? And is there a relationship between the concentrations of triclosan, the exposure time, and the four variables being measured? To conduct this study, seawater was collected from Castine Harbor and sterilized using an autoclave machine, as well as 12 400 milliliter beakers. Each beaker was labeled with a treatment group, either control, low, medium, or high, and also a number one to 12 to keep track of the treatment groups when randomly assorted during the measuring period. Each beaker was filled with 250 milliliters of sterilized seawater and about a quarter teaspoon of Artemia salina cysts, as well as an air stone. The air stone was placed into each beaker to ensure there was a water flow and oxygen current going through because without this, the shrimp would die from either hypoxia or anoxia rather than the triclosan. After a 24 hour growth period, Aceline and Nopoli were measured as a baseline measurement to begin the data collection. 
and then exposed to one of four treatment groups. So the control was sterilized seawater. The low was 37.5 microliters of triclosan. The medium was 42.5 microliters, and the high was 47.5 microliters. And then parafilm was placed over each beaker to reduce any evaporation. Measurements were taken every other day over a 14-day exposure period. This was done using a Nikon Eclipse 50i microscope with a spot digital camera attached to the top and the spot software through the computer. The pictures capture, captured in each image were converted to micrometers through the software. Length was measured from the head to the tail of Artemia Selena and the width was measured using the widest part of the body, which was typically near the head. Pigmentation was a qualitative measurement using a numerical scale that I created. A value of one was a light color pigmentation on the body, usually a clear pigment. Value two was a medium pigmentation on the body, so this was like a light brown pigment, which was on like 50% or less of the body. And Three was the darkest pigmentation, which is usually a dark brown pigment on 50% or more of the body. For data analysis, a standard multiple linear regression was used to determine whether the activity of acelina among the growth uh, had an effect between the concentrations of triclosan and the exposure time. Results show that there was a significant negative relationship among the length, activity, and pigmentation of Artemia salina with the concentration of triclosan and the exposure time. For length and arm beats, um, so length is the graph furthest over, closest to me, and as you can see, they kind of all grow together, and then around day seven, the control kind of plateaus off, and the three treatment groups of triclosan uh, start to have a decrease in length. Arm beats, which is the graph in the middle, um, kind of does the same thing. The three treatments also decrease over time, but the control group, the arm beats, and their movement kind of stay the same throughout. For pigmentation, I use this as a qualitative measurement, and what I indicated from the graph was that Nopoli of a smaller size had a darker brown pigment, um, compared to larger nopoli with a clear pigment. It seems pigmentation was another indicator of growth, and the graph indicates that the higher triglosan concentrations had a larger amount of nopoli with darker pigment, and therefore were smaller in size. Width, however, had no significant relationship with the concentration of triglosan, but there was a relationship over time. Each concentration had similar width measurements and the width actually increased over time. This could potentially be an effect of hormesis. So a study done by Garcia Espinera et al. in 2018, which is the graph on the left for you guys. Um, graph A shows the length over um, a 24-hour period using three different chemicals, bisphenol A, propylparaben, and triclosan. And as you can see, there is a slight decrease in triclosan over the 24-hour period. Graph B shows the width, and as you can see, the um, width actually increases in all three um, chemical treatments. The width may have increased due to hormesis, like I said earlier, which is a phenomenon that enhances the physiology of organisms when under low stress levels. Figure on the right shows the activity of, um, of Artemia salina with four different concentrations as well, and as you can see, it decreases over time as the concentration increases. So this study is important because it measures the sublethal effects of triclosan on acelina rather, rather than the mortality rate which other toxicity studies tend to focus on. Therefore, it's important to continue finding out information about the sublethal effects and the negative impacts they have on the environment.
one thing, one thing that I found in my project is that the way I analyzed my results wasn't typical toxicity testing um, graphs. Usually you find an EC50. Um, so I think I would have either done my results different to actually kind of determine the actual toxicity um, or I would do the addition of like another chemical such as trichocarbon, which is pretty similar to triclosan, but it's actually even more harmful. So I think that would have been kind of cool to compare the two and see which one does more damage. Our next speaker is Audrey, who's going to talk to us about uh, the effects of temperature on the blue muscle. Take it away. All right. Hi, my name is Audrey Aragon, and today I'll be presenting my senior research, the effects of elevated temperature on the uh, production of visceral threads in the blue muscle Mytilus edulis. So the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change concluded with very high confidence in 2022 that anthropogenic climate change, or the causes to the Earth's climate that are caused by human activities, have a major impact on coastal marine life. Greenhouse gases are naturally occurring and they trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere, which create a livable environment. Many human activities are causing for increased quantities of greenhouse gases to be emitted, and as more heat is being trapped in the atmosphere, more heat is being trapped in the ocean as well, or in bodies of water. Um, global air temperatures increasing cause for water temperatures to increase as well because water absorbs heat from air. I'll be st um, my study was focused on the Gulf of Maine, which you can see in the picture on the screen, which has in experienced a much faster warming than any of the other bodies of water in the world. So the blue muscle Mytilus edulis is a common intertidal bivalve found here in the Gulf of Maine. Their habitats are naturally variable. Their um, tides range from high to low. Their high wave exposure and their high variable temperatures as well. They're a foundation species, which means that they create a larger and more diverse habitat. They're also important filter feeders and they're a large part of the state of Maine fisheries. Blue mussels use bissel threads, which you can see here is a blue mussel that has secreted the bissel threads to attach to a substrate. And then on the right side, you could see the anatomy of a bissel thread. There's the proximal, which is, a, which is the part that's closest to the muscle, the distal, and then the plaque, which connects to the substrate. Um, they're fibers that are made of protein, and they're very strong, which protect the muscles from weather exposure and exposure to predation as well. Um, it's been found that their production may be changing due to climate change. So the study aimed to analyze how bissel thread production changes in warmed waters. Sorry, negative impacts on bissel production can make blue mussels more susceptible to predation and weather exposure. So I hypothesized that increasing temperatures can make, um, could decrease bissel thread production, length, and tensile strength in the blue mussel. Um, and then I aim to answer the question, do increasing water temperatures due to climate change affect bissel thread morphology in the blue mussel Mytilus edulis? So I, co I collected mussels here from the docks at Maine Maritime Academy. Um, during the collection, I measured each one of the mussels individually to make sure that they were at approximately the same stage of life. Each mussel was housed in individual plastic containers, which you could see with the orange and then the very dark blue little squares. Um, each of these was then placed into a 10 gallon tank, which is like the slightly darker blue rectangles. Um, and they were all placed into a wet lab table. Each one of the tanks had an aerator, which, is the, which are the gray lines. And the warmed treatment had tank heaters that were set to 20 degrees Celsius, which are the little gray circles over there. Um, after I placed each one of the mussels in their housing, I gave them two weeks to acclimate, and I changed the water every two days with water that was pulled directly from Castine Harbor. After this acclimation period, I removed the mussels from the tanks, I cut the bissel threads as close to the shell as possible, and then I changed the water, cleaned them, and placed them back into their respective tanks for two more days. After those two days, I started my data collection where I counted the bissel threads, I measured them with digital calipers, 
And then in the last two data collections, I used a spring tensometer to measure the tensile strength. Um, after each data collection, I cleaned the tanks, their housing, and the substrate that they were placed on, as well as making sure that there were no remaining Bissell threads. And I put them back in their respective containers. I used SPSS to do analysis. I did t-tests to determine if there was a significant difference in the temperatures that they were being housed in and in the tensile strength. And I did a lin linear regression analysis to see if there was a significant relationship between the number of the treatments and the Bissell thread length and number. So there, there was a significant or difference in the temperatures that the muscles were housed in with a p-value of 0 0.001. Um, so that meant that the muscles were exposed to warm temperatures in the warm treatment. Um, I didn't find a significant relationship between the ambient Bissell thread number and collections with a p-value of 0 0.11. And there was also no significant relationship between the Bissell length in millimeters and the collections with a p-value of 0 0.24. Bissell thread number over the six collections in the warmed treatment also yielded no significant re relationship with a p-value of 0 0.85. And the Bissell thread length in millimeters also had no significant relationship with a p-value of 0 0.94. I also found that temp tensile strength was not affected by the temperature treatment. Um, the p-value was 0 0.077 between the two. So because there was a significant difference in the two temperatures, we can assume, safely assume that they were exposed to a warmed temperature. Um, and that any of the data that I got was because of a difference. Um, but since there was no relationship between the two treatments, we can uh, safely assume that warmed water does not alter the way that muscles produce their muscle threads. Um, it's possible that these results are related to seasonal variability in the muscle thread growth. Studies such as Garner et al. in 2013, Moser et al. in 2006, and Young in 1983 all showed that basal thread production is lowest in the fall and winter and that they are highest in the spring and summer. Um, it's also been shown that muscles can adapt their tolerance throughout the year. So because of the warming and the marine heat waves that the Gulf of Maine has experienced, as we can see in this graph up on the screen, that um, temperatures have been increasing over the years it's possible that they've already adapted to these warm temperatures. Um, the results raise a question of how ocean acidification also plays a role in bissel thread production, as previous studies such as Nolan et al. have found decreases in bissel thread production when warmed water was combined with acidification. Um, because these results contrast previous studies, I think they open a window to expand this research and they f and able to further conversations about blue mussels abilities to adapt under the stressors of climate change. And I'd just like to thank Professor Cleveland for being my advisor, Professors Mullen and Whitney for guiding our class, and Pam for making sure we had all of the materials we needed. Yeah, it's possible. Um, I don't have the citations here, but a few studies have shown that there are stressors that change um, bissel thread production. So it's possible that me changing the water or cutting the threads every couple of days, which I did model after another um, after other research, could have had an impact on that as well. Uh, I have one. I'll piggyback okay. off of Chris Mueller last time. What would you do differently? Or what would you, not maybe not differently, what would you recommend the next um, person do? I think maybe expanding it definitely would help and adding different seasonal variations. So adding tanks that reflect spring, summer, winter, and fall. 
um, as other studies have done. And yeah, I think that's <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're going to stick with the temperature theme, and Kyle is going to talk to us about how temperature has impacted the photosynthesis of a coralline algae. I'm going to let you pronounce it, Kyle. Gotcha. <laughs> let me just raise this a bit. No, I'm just <laughs> it's a little harder than I thought. <laughs> uh, yes, ma'am. Do I have to use this? That's better. Okay, all good? Yeah. Hi, so my name is Kyle Smith, and today I'll be presenting on my topic, which deals with how ocean temperatures have affected the photosynthetic pigments of Lithothamion glacial. A little bit of background about my project. I decided to do this because, as we all know, the world's ocean water temperatures are warming. However, the Gulf of Maine is warming at a rate of 96% faster than the rest of the world's waters. And I wanted to know what this meant for all-encompassing biota that inhabit the Gulf of Maine. And when I mean all-encompassing biota, I don't just mean the iconic Maine lobster. I wanted to look at how it would affect the bottom of our trophic level, because we know that the bottom of the trophic le level ultimately affects the well-being of the upper species. And for this, I wanted to look at algae. However, the algae I decided to look at isn't the typical algae you think of. I decided to look at a coralline algae species known as Lithothermion glacial. Now, although this algae does resemble a coral, it, 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 they are very much different. Lithothermion glacial gets its energy through the process of photosynthesis. However, corals receive their energy through symbiotic zooxanthellae. And I believe it is important to know how heat will impact this, this organism because this organism does not only provide energy and oxygen to its environment, it also removes CO2 that is entering the environment and it acts as a habitat for the creatures inhabiting the Gulf of Maine. With that being said, the objectives of this study were to see how temperature affects the photosynthetic pigments of Lithothermion glacial. Now, in order to put, do this experiment, I had to figure out which pigments I wanted to zero in on. For this, I chose two pigments, phycoerythrin, which is a photosynthetic pigment that is responsible for giving Lithothermion glacial its bright red color. And also, I chose chlorophyll A because I feel like the words chlorophyll and photosynthesis are tightly netted together. The reason I chose phycoerythrin was because during my pilot project, I noticed that during my temperature experiments, the coral, I mean the algae, would start to lose its pigmentation and turn white. And I wanted to see if this would actually affect its photosynthetic levels. In order to see how the pigments were doing, I had four main steps for extracting them. However, first I had to go gather nine samples of this algae at Wadsworth Cove, located here in Casting, Maine. After that, I brought them back to the lab located in Rogers Hall, and I began my extractions. I started off by breaking off approximately one gram of lithothermion glacial and grinding it, grinding it down into a fine powder. Then, after I chose what pigment I wanted, I started with chlorophyll A. I added seven milliliters of acetone into the powder and let it sit there for about two minutes in order to extract all the pigments. Then, the solution was placed into a plastic test tube and transferred to a centrifuge, but it was centrifuged at 1,300 RPMs for 10 minutes. This was because due to the algae's calcareous shell, sometimes when transferring it from the mortar and pestle to the test tube, some of that shell would get inside of the test tubes and I didn't want anything to mess up the fluorometer's reading. After all nine samples were centrifuged, this liquid supernatant was then moved from the test tube into a smaller glass test tube where it was then placed in the fluorometer, and I was able to find out the concentration of pigmentation for chlorophyll A. These same processes were repeated for phycoerythrin, except instead of using acetone, I used two milliliters of liquid nitrogen and gave that liquid nitrogen the appropriate time that it needed to dissipate. After this was done, seven milliliters of water were added to act as a natural solvent. After these initial extractions were done and the pigment concentrations were recorded, the algae was placed in their respective tanks. I had three temperature treatments for this. I had one tank set at an ambient temperature, which came out to an average of 15.6 degrees Celsius, 
One tank set at an elevated temperature that came out to an average of 23.8 degrees Celsius, and one tank at a high temperature treatment, which came out to about 26.9 degrees Celsius. The algae was left in their tanks for approximately, for exactly 26 days. Over the course of this 26 day time period, extractions were done on time zero, day 15, and day 26. This was so I could track the algae's progress in the photosynthetic pigments over the course of the experiment and not just beginning to end. In addition with tracking the algae's pigment, physiological changes were also marked by taking pictures at every single extraction point. The results of my study I found out by using SPSS using a univarial laterate data analysis. As you can see from the figure on my left, chlorophyll A was not significantly uh, had no significant change in pigmentation from the beginning of the experiment to the end of the experiment. However, when looking at the higher temperature treatments, I, we can see that there is less chlorophyll A pigmentation, which means that there could be a correlation between temperature and chlorophyll A pigmentation concentration, although it is not significant. However, when dealing with phycoerythrin pigmentation, we can see that there is a significant difference from the beginning from the beginning pigmentation concentration to the end of the experiment. All right, so this study can show how photosynthetic pigments can affect other coralline algae in the Gulf of Maine. I say this because when, after getting the results of my research, my biggest question was why did phycoerythrin experience a change that was significant and chlorophyll A did not? After reading multiple articles, I found that although Phycoerythrin is responsible for helping the organism photosynthesize. It doesn't produce as much uh, energy as chlorophyll A would. This means that when it was under temperature stress, that the algae cho chose to give up uh, phycoerythrin because it was did not want to give up that chlorophyll A because chlorophyll A is its main powerhouse. I believe that this research was important because we need to know what the biota in the Gulf of Maine are facing. Since there is a significant difference in pigmentation regarding phycoerythrin and less chlorophyll A overall in the elevated temperature treatments, it's safe to assume that higher temperatures will lead to the algae not being able to photosynthesize as much. This means they will not be able to produce as much oxygen for their environment, take out as much CO2, and they will not be able to provide habitats and shelters for the organisms. Along with it affecting lithothermine glacial specifically, this is not the only coralline alga that is living within the Gulf of Maine. On the screen here, I have two other pictures of coralline algae species that live in the Gulf of Maine. These types of algae provide habitats and also energy and oxygen for the environment. So if we know what they're up against, we can better learn how to help them survive so we can keep our ecosystem going. Lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mullen for being an outstanding advisor. She's always helped me out, even outside of class. Professor Whitney for always grading my paragraphs, and I mean a lot. <laughs> Uh, Pam for always helping me out. She's, I think I was at your office at least every two weeks. And uh, all of you guys, because although this was my project, I couldn't have done it alone. Whether it was gathering samples or getting a lab buddy, uh, this was definitely a group effort. Thank you. Maybe when I was dealing with my uh, SPSS data analysis, I found that although there was no significant difference in pigmentation, that the amount of time that the algae were under the temperature treatments actually was significant since I had those three data points. So maybe if they were left in there longer, I could have seen a more significant change in pigmentation and concentration. this work for. <laughs> Bring that back on down here. All right, next up we're going to hear from Michaela who's going to talk to us about lobsters and their bait preferences. 
Take it away. All right, so hello everyone. My name is Michaela Wallace, and the title of my senior research project is Bait Preference and Behavior of American Lobsters, Homeris Americanus, to pick hide or pogey bait. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, my study is based on the optimal foraging theory, which is the theory of how animals choose their diets. Um, and the diagram to the left kind of shows a visual rep representation of it. Um, so TT stands for travel time, and the TP stands for time and patch. And you can see as travel time increases, um, the time and patch kind of reaches a tangent point. Um, and this is because the more time organisms stay in the patch, um, this they can gain resources and um, essentially have more energy to increase their travel time as well as um, consume more prey. So it's extremely important um, to understand the behavioral patterns of lobsters um, in determining if they have a preference or not or how they choose their diets. Um, because in the, uh, you can see on the diagram on the left here, um, in the past couple of decades, um, herring landings have been diminishing due to overfishing. Um, and herring was the main bait used by lobster fishermen. So fishermen are really trying to find um, an alternate source of bait to use uh, to sustain their industry. Um, so my objectives for this study was to determine if there um, is a significant difference in lobster behaviors when given the options of pig, hag, and pogey, as well as given lobster behavior patterns, do lobsters have a significant difference um, in preference among pig, hag, and pogey baits? And what I hypothesized is that the lobsters would have um, um, more behavioral patterns and prefer the pig hide rather than the pokey uh, just because pig hide it has a more fattier content to it um, containing more nutrients which could greater the energy and travel time of the lobsters. Um, so as for my methods I collected a total of 20 lobsters. Four lobsters were collected each week for five weeks and these the lobsters and bait we're both collected at Wallace's Lobster Wharf in Friendship, Maine. And before transferring them all to the MMA waterfront, um, I would usually weigh the lobsters on the scale of the dock. And then once transferred, before placing them in the holding tank, which you can see here in figure one, um, I would measure the, each lobster from the end of their tail to the tip of their claws, and then unband them, place them in the holding tank to be starved for 24 hours prior um, to all trials, and I did this by feeding them one open muscle. So once they all had equal hunger levels, they were placed in the testing tank here in figure two, um, and I'd kind of just randomize the bait on either side just so they wouldn't tend to prefer one side over the other. And I'd place the lobsters in the middle and then kind of leave them alone for 30 minute trials, and I did do all my trials during the night um, just to avoid any human interference. So I had uh, two overhead red lights um, along with two cameras situated by ropes um, facing down at either one of the baits. Um, and then after each trial, I would just drain the tank um, and give it a good wash down just to avoid any chemical cues from uh, lobsters in prior trials. So as for what I observed, um, when I went back and looked at my recordings, um, I looked at five behaviors. I looked at touch, roam, forage, rest, and claw. And within all these behaviors, um, I took the time intervals and then took these time intervals and imported them into Excel, where I calculated the total average duration, total duration, and total count. And then I took this data and processed it into our studio, where I did a uh, non-parametric um, dependent pair t-test Willococcin. So as for my results, um, all my behaviors did not show any significant difference um, in total duration, total count, and total average duration um, between the two um, baits. Um, but there were certain trends seen. Um, the pig hide, for example, in figure three, um, the pig hides spent a longer duration. Um, or sorry, the lobster spent longer durations around the pig hide, um, whereas they, as for count, they spent more time around the pogey. Um, but that's for the touch behavior. And the roam behavior is kind of the opposite of that, contradicts it. 
And for the forage behavior in figure five, um, kind of same thing as the touch behavior, spent more durations around the pig hide, but as for count, lobsters tended to um, amount of times around the pokey. And as for figure six, um, the pokey tended, or sorry, the lobster tended to, um, it's kind of the opposite, spend more duration around the pokey rather than the pig hide. But as for the claw behavior, this one was almost significantly different with a p-value of a little bit over 0.05, um, but it uh, turned out to not be significant. Uh, but you can see visually that in figure seven, the pogey did um, spend more duration, or sorry, the lobster spent more durations around the pig hide, as well as how many times they spent um, around the pig hide was greater than the pogey as well. So in conclusion, um, even though there were no significant differences in my study, um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, because this does give fishermen more uh, sources of alternative baits and more options, especially um, since they could go for the less pricier bait, whereas uh, pig hide tends to be a lot cheaper than pogey. I think pogey is around 200 a barrel, whereas pig hide is only like $40 a bucket. So this could um, save the fishermen money in the long run, as well as keep their um, withstanding their industry. That's it. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Kyle? Okay, so a barrel. So a bucket is like just a normal, regular bucket, but a barrel is, I don't know the exact size, but it's a lot bigger than a bucket. But also, the pig hide is a lot bigger than the pogey, especially since pogey, their size range has have been decreasing as well. Like they just keep getting smaller and smaller, and that's probably something to do with the climate and everything. So pig hide is genuinely, you can get more slabs of it, more bait, in just one slab of pig hide. So. Your question? Yes. Might be outside, outside of your study, but I'm wondering if you mm -hmm. thought about a recommendation for utilization of pig hide facilities, right? So that they don't have a crashing um, supply, right? Have you thought about yeah. like what a recommendation might be around that? You, you showed us the herring data, and so mm -hmm. if we switch Baits, mm -hmm. do you see or have you come across anything that might suggest something similar to what you're doing here? Just to get more of a bait source. Like our pig oh, hide short supply or um, pogey, pogey, they, well, they have, because um, people pogey all the time, but they do have like restrictions on it and stuff. So that, the same thing with like that has been happening to herring could potentially definitely happen to pogey baits. And where did pig hide come? Um, that, I, I did my research on that, and I couldn't find it. I think it's just, far, like, farmers. Is I th it main thing? But they don't make the, yeah. It is coming from Yeah, them. like, some, there's, there, it's kind of funny, but, like, some people just randomly, like, sell it. Like, have their own little business and just sell the buckets of pig hide. But I don't know where they get it from, so. <laughs> All right, thank you, Michaela. Thank you. All right, next we're gonna hear from Haley, who's gonna talk to us about the um, sorption of chemical pollutants by different types of plastic. So thank you, Haley. Yes. So hello, my name's Haley Greenleaf, and my senior research project is characterizing the sorption of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons by petroleum-based plastic versus biodegradable bio-based plastic. So the large-scale production of plastic began just 70 years ago, and plastic pollution has been accumulating in aquatic and terrestrial environments ever since then. The lifespan of petroleum-based plastics is estimated to be hundreds to thousands of years. 
and consequently environmental concerns regarding petroleum-based plastics since they are not being efficiently recycled nor transformed into energy has supported a shift to using biodegradable bio-based plastics such as polylactic acid or PLA. Not only are plastics a pollutant, but they also pose a chemical threat to ecosystems because they are known to absorb toxic contaminants into them. And so plastics can act as a vehicle for transporting hydrophobic contaminants throughout aquatic environments. One subset of these contaminants are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, which are toxic compounds that are byproducts of combustion. Essentially, PAHs are hydrophobic nonpolar compounds, and plastics act as an ideal substrate for PAHs to absorb into when in aquatic environments. PAHs are important compounds to study because they are carcinogenic and mutagenic. Long-term exposure to these compounds can cause health issues such as liver damage and cancers. Previous studies, including Lonkarski et al. 2021, found that petroleum-based plastics such as polyethylene absorb significantly more PAHs in, in greater concentration and more quickly than biodegradable bio-based plastics. Shown here are four kinetics curves, or the uptake of four PAH compounds, naphthalene, fluorine, fluoranthine, and pyrene, over time. You can see circled in the legend is PLA, the biodegradable bio-based plastic. It absorbed significantly less PAHs, all four of these, than the remaining plastics, all of which are petroleum-based. The first objective of my study was to characterize the sorption kinetics of three PAH compounds into polyethylene and into PLA. And my second objective was to characterize the total sorption capacity into each plastic. Polyethylene is a widely used petroleum-based plastic that is known to absorb PAHs as both PAHs and polyethylene have a nonpolar chemical structure. Polylactic acid has a more polar structure than polyethylene and so I hypothesized that it would absorb fewer PAHs than polyethylene. The production of PLA is projected to increase five-fold in the next five years. However, little is known about how chemicals like PAHs absorb into PLA plastic. My study was unique because previous studies have not observed the absorption of PAH compounds, phenanthrene, chrysine, and benzoapyrene into PLA plastic. So for a brief rundown of my methods, I began by making a 100 microgram per liter solution of PAHs in deionized water. I then incubated my pieces of plastic in that PAH solution for varying time intervals, including 2, 4, 12, and 48 hours in order to create kinetics curves, which I will talk about later. So after I incubated my pieces of plastic in the PAH solution, I then extracted the PAHs out of them using hexane spiked with deuterated PAHs. And deuterated PAHs act as a tracer which can be used to adjust the amount of PAHs that may have been lost throughout the extraction process. So once I had my extract, I then had to reduce the volume of it using the TurboVap, which aids in evaporation by submerging the sample in a hot water bath and by blowing a gentle stream of nitrogen gas over the surface of it. I then analyzed my sample using gas chromatography tandem mass spectrometry. So essentially my sample was first put into the GC where it was vaporized, blown through the chromatography column with an inert gas, and lighter compounds such as phenanthrene moved through the column more quickly than bulkier, heavier compounds like benzoapyrene. I then analyzed my samples, and so I performed a t-test to see if one plastic had a significantly greater absorption of PAH compounds than the other. So shown here are my kinetics curves. The x-axis is the amount of time that the plastic was incubated in the PAH solution, and the y-axis is the concentration of that PAH compound absorbed per milligram of plastic. For phenanthrene on the left and benzoapyrene in the middle, you can see that the rate of absorption into polyethylene, which is the orange line, was greater than the rate of absorption into PLA, the blue line. And I compared the rate of absorption by looking at the slope, like which slope was steeper. So the slope of the orange line was greater for both phenanthrene and benzoapyrene. I could not make a comparison for that for chrysine, as there was a dip in the initial absorption of 
pricing into PLA, so a comparison could not have been made between the rates there. And in regards to total sorption capacity, polyethylene absorbed significantly more concentration of all PAHs than PLA as all P values were less than 0.05. And on the figure, you can see that phenanthrene was absorbed in the greatest concentration into both plastics. And please note that this is represented on a log scale. And additionally, with increased molecular weight of the PAH compound meant a lesser amount was absorbed into the plastic. So benzoapyrene had the greatest molecular weight and it was absorbed in the least amount into both plastics. The results of this study agree with my hypothesis and previous work by Lonkarski et al. 2021, who found that plastic polymer type significantly impacted the absorption of PAHs. In that study, polyethylene absorbed significantly greater concentration of all PAHs than polylactic acid. These results suggest that a replacement of petroleum-based plastics by biodegradable bio-based plastics may reduce the role that plastics play in transporting PAHs throughout aquatic environments. I would like to thank the following individuals for their assistance and encouragement in making this research possible. Thank you. Questions for Haley? I have one. Uh, it's your study and the study you referenced seems so obvious. So why aren't we using more biodegradable plastics? There hasn't been a transition yet. Um, I think because we do support the petroleum industry so much. Um, plastic production of like PLA, that's based off of um, corn and sugarcane, which it's not really on like a, a large scale of producing plastic that way yet. But it looks like the market is shifting that way. All right, thanks Haley. Thank you. Okay, next up we are going to hear from Phoebe, who is going to talk to us about salinity changes and how it impacts um, sand dollars. Thanks, Phoebe. All right. Okay. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about the effects of short-term salinity changes on the metabolic rate and burrowing behavior of the sand dollar Echeneric Neas Parma. So why is this important? Well, in the context of global warming and climate change, the Gulf of Maine is warming approximately 96% faster than the rest of the world's oceans, which places our own backyard and organisms at risk from both rising sea levels and increased extreme weather events. So this diagram here on the left is showing the, an increase in the number of hurricanes over a 160 year period in the North Atlantic. And as you can see, the trend is upwards and positive. So, what this is showing is that an increased temperature is resulting in higher evaporation rates leading to higher precipitation rates and increased river runoff, which may create unpredictable salinity stratification in non-rocky intertidal zones, which basically just means that there's potential for much lower and much higher salinities. And the organisms found in, the, in this zone may face consequences as a result. An example of an organism found in the lower intertidal to subtidal zone are sand dollars, where they work as um, bioturbators where they oxygenate surface sediment as well as directly bury carbon. And they may face consequences, consequences as a result of these short-term changes in salinity due to how they regulate their internal fluids to their external environment. So prior studies have looked at how um, sand dollar larvae is, is affected by this variation in salinity. However, very few studies have actually looked at how adult sand dollars are affected by salinity changes. So this diagram here on the right is showing the mean percent fertilized of sand dollar larvae compared to a variation of salinities. And as you can see, below 22 PSU, there is little to no fertilization that occurs with sand dollar larvae. So in general, there is a scarcity of literature that documents how changing salinity affects adult sand dollars physiologically. The objectives of my study were to understand the physiological and behavioral responses of sand dollars to these acute changes in salinity. Specifically, I was asking, is there metabolism and is there burrowing behavior influenced by these salinities? So how I answered this is I created four salinity treatments which were based off of that larval 
larval exposure literature, which were 22, 27, 32, and 37 PSU. I then recorded the oxygen consumption of sand dollars using a Biopack MP36 system in conjunction with a vernier dissolved oxygen probe, and then sand dollars were placed in a respiration chamber. This creates an oxygen consumption slope that I was able to then use to calculate the metabolism for each sand dollar. Now, as for the burrowing behavior, sand dollars were placed in individual containers where they had freshly collected sediment to burrow into, and then they were placed with respective salinity treatment seawaters. My GoPro was hung in a hanging basket above the containers where it recorded via time lapse the amount of time it took for them to burrow completely in the sediment, which you can see in this clip on the left. I then statistically analyzed my data using a non-parametric Kruskal-Wallis ANOVA test due to the small sample size of my study. So now as for the results, one second. This uh, graph right here is representative of the respiration rate portion of my study. So on the y-axis is respiration rate, showing micrograms of oxygen consumed per gram body weight of each sand dollar per hour. And to reiterate, the four salinity treatments I used were uh, starting with the lowest was 22, then 27, then 32, which was the ambient salinity treatment, and then 37, which was my high salinity treatment. So as you can see, sand dollars exposed to the 22 PSU salinity treatment had about twice as much oxygen consumption as those sand dollars exposed to the 32 ambient salinity treatment, whereas those exposed to the 27 and the 37 salinity treatments had intermediate respirations as, the, as to those of the lower and ambient treatments. So histograms that are sharing a letter are not significantly different from one another. So what my results demonstrate is that the amount of oxygen consumed by E. parma was significantly different between the lower salinity treatments and the ambient salinity treatment. So now as for the behavioral portion of my study, this graph is showing the complete cover burrowing time in minutes of the sand dollars, again compared to those four treatment salinities. And as you can see, all of these histograms share the same letter. So what this demonstrates is that the amount of time that E. parma used to completely burrow in the sediment was not significantly different across any of the salinity treatments. And so kind of what does all this wrap up into is that the metabolic rate results of my study suggest that sand dollars employ cell volume regulation in order to acclimate to short-term environmental salinity changes. So what this graph on the left is showing is osmoconformers, and then the graph on the right is hyper-iso-osmoregulators. And what this means is that, well, so they both share the same y-axis, and then they also both share the same x-axis. So the y-axis is osmolality of internal medium. And what that is just referring to is how salty the internal fluids of that invertebrate organism is. So this is a general study. So an osmo, oh, and then the x-axis is an environmental salinity gradient. So what it is showing is that this is low salinity, whereas this portion is high salinity. So an osmoconformer is an organism that when placed in a low salinity environment will match its internal fluids to be as salty as that. So they will have a low internal salinity e equivalent to their external salinity. Similarly, if they're placed in a high salinity environment, they will conform to that environment and match their internal salinity to that external salinity. Whereas a hyper regulator will utilize cell volume regulation in order to kind of maintain a saltier internal environment compared to the low salinity external environment that they may be placed into. Whereas they will conform similarly to osmoconformers in a high salinity environment. So what does this have to do with respiration? Well, Prior studies have investigated, in general, with invertebrates, how this regulation impacts the respiration of an organism. So what this graph now on the left is showing is hyper-iso-osmoregulators again, which is this graph, with respiration, which are those dashed lines, which is our new y-axis. Feel free to ignore these solid lines. That's free radical formation. I did not study that, and it is way more complicated. Um, so respiration, what this is showing is that some invertebrates in a low salinity environment will have a higher oxygen consumption, aka they will be investing more energy to um, regulate that process, whereas they will have a lower oxygen consumption in a higher salinity environment. So um, this is how my results compare to hyper-iso-osmoregulators. 
So each dot is representative of a salinity that I tested. So the low salinity of 22 PSU, high salinity of 37 PSU. And what this is showing is that with short-term exposure to these salinities, my sand dollars tend to follow this hyper iso regulator trend, indicating that they will invest more energy to acclimate to, to low salinity environments. So it would be important to investigate this further to understand how sand dollars will conform to longer exposure of these salinity environments. And then the other hypothesis of my study was that the burrowing behavior would be impacted by these cellular processes, but there was no significant difference in that portion of my study. So, yeah. <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> Acknowledgements. Yes. Professor Bear. Oh, yes, I can repeat it. Okay, so Professor Bear asked if, um, as for the behavior portion, if other than time, what I may have seen would have been indicative indicative of the behavior impacts. Um, okay, so one study that I did look at was looking kind of more at the locomotion of tropical sand dollars, where it was focused less on time and more on the amount of sediment that was physically being bioturbated. So I think that would be an interesting thing to look more into rather than just time, because it, I was time constricted and I was also space limited, um, so having a larger treatment container for burrowing behavior may have had some different impacts. I hope that answered your question. Okay. Thank you, Phoebe. All right, next up, Jenny is going to tell us a story about how temperature impacts um, metabolism and feeding of the blue mussel. All right, can we hear me all right? Sweet. Okay, so my senior research is investigating the effects on rising water temperatures on the metabolic rates and plankton clearance rates of the blue mussel, Matillus edilis. So as we've heard from many presentations so far, the Gulf of, Maine, Gulf of Maine is warming much faster than other regions in the world. A study done by Pershing et al. has found that since 2004, the 
average warming rate in the Gulf of Maine has been about 0.23 degrees Celsius per year. Their figure from the same study also shows that the daily water temperatures shown in part A of their figure in the blue line and their annual average water temperature for the Gulf of Maine shown with the black dots both show a trend of waters warming since the 80s. Part B of their figure shows that our region, which is kind of hard to see right here, the Gulf of Maine, is warming greater throughout compared to the global ocean. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has also claimed that the global ocean as a whole will warm on average between 2.3 degrees Celsius and 4 degrees Celsius by 2100. This long-term warming is inevitable and is concerning for marine organisms who cannot easily distribute themselves away from this warming, such as bivalves, which is, includes the blue mussel Metilus edulis. This warming is concerning because the blue mussel is known as an ectotherm. An ectotherm is an organism whose metabolism and related processes such as feeding are impacted by the environmental temperature of their surroundings. This means that as waters warm, their metabolism and feeding rates should also increase with that rise. A study done by Matu et al. has already claimed that in the Gulf of Maine there's been a 60% decline in the blue mussel population. This future warming that is expected to come seems concerning and could possibly worsen this population decline. This leads me to my study question, which is does a five degree Celsius increase in water temperature significantly affect the metabolic rates and plankton clearance rates of the blue mussel? And just so we're all on the same page, metabolic rates can be found through respiration rates, which is finding the consumption of dissolved oxygen, and plankton clearance rates is the concentration of plankton cleared or taken in by the blue mussel. So how I answer this study question is I use a closed respirometry system, which is demonstrated through my figure of my respiration chambers. I put a known concentration of plankton into the respiration chambers, and I find the ox oxygen consumption data of just the plankton for the first 30 minutes. Once that is complete, I put a muscle into the respiration chamber and find the oxygen, oxygen consumption data of both the plankton and the muscle for another 30 minutes. In both scenarios, the respiration chambers are covered in aluminum foil to prevent phytoplankton from producing oxygen when in light. This process is done for both temperature treatments, my 21 degrees Celsius treatment and my 26 degree temperature treatment. Once, all, once the last treatment is done, I find the difference in concentration of plankton after it was exposed to a muscle into the chamber, and then I use the oxygen consumption data to find the net metabolic rate of the muscle. All this data is statistically analyzed through SPSS using a non-parametric Mann-Whitney-U test. And this test is to show if there were significant differences in my metabolic rates and plankton clearance rates between the 21 and 26 degrees Celsius treatments. And what I found so far from my metabolic rates was that the five degree temperature increase had no significant effect on the metabolic rates of the blue mussel. This data suggests that perhaps since my temperature increase is lining up with global climate change models, the blue mussel in the Gulf of Maine may actually be okay. They'll maintain their health through their metabolism and feed just fine. And similarly, I found that the five degree increase in water temperature had no significant effect on the plankton clearance rates of the blue mussel. Although while not significant, it is worth noting that the mussels exposed to the 26 degree temperature treatment had elevated plankton clearance rates, which I think a further study should go investigate why this may be the case compared to metabolic rates. Because I unfortunately throughout my research did not find a great explanation for this. Overall, throughout the entire research pro process, I found that all the studies I was looking at, they either said that my five degree difference in treatments had, could have a significant effect on metabolism and plankton clearance rates, or they could not have a significant effect. A study that supports my results is Kittner and Risgard, and they discuss that this no significance between the temperature treatments could be due to acclimation temperature. They discuss that 
the temperature at which the muscles are acclimated to could shift their temperature tolerance range. This means, so in normal conditions, the muscle will have a range of temperatures in which the metabolism and plankton clearance rates will act normally and are at optimal levels. A muscle acclimated to a warmer temperature may have that temperature tolerance range increase to withstand warmer temperatures. So this may explain why I didn't see any significant results at all. And then lastly, there have been articles um, stating that predation may be a greater cause and may be contributing to that 60% decline in blue muscle population. There are many predators to the blue muscle, which includes the green crab shown here, which it is an invasive species to the Gulf of Maine. I believe knowing, proposing this sort of study question would be if the, like what predators could be impacting this population decline in the blue mussel. A study could look at green crabs compared to say a seabird or some other organism that could be preying on the mussel. But overall from the research I've conducted and my data suggests that this warming that is expected by 2100 should not impact the blue mussel overall. And then lastly, to conclude, I just want to thank everyone listed here and thank everyone who showed up today to listen to all of us talk. And then <laughs> um, to all my lab partners who were lab buddies with me at some point in the process. Thank you. Questions for Jenny? Ah, Emily. No, it's okay. <laughs> so you mentioned that you had a significant, in or not a significant, but a drastic increase in the planting clearance rates in the higher temperature. Do you have a hypothesis or maybe like ideas of why that could be? While I don't know if it would be affected by temperature, some other idea I had is that the plankton I collected to put into my chambers were a natural selection from the Castine Harbor. I'm wondering if at some point when doing the warmer temperatures, if somehow I had collected a certain species of plankton that the mussels may have preferred. Because naturally when I collected my plankton every time I was running these respiration trials, there could have been a variability in the plankton composition in that water. So I'm wondering if there might have been a food preference, which I think should be investigated further. I'm, now that you say that, I'm wondering if they're, sorry, plankton, right? Um, if the temperature impacted the phytoplankton. So if they exuded some yummy carbon that maybe made them a, a, you know, a stronger food source for the mussels that maybe weren't impacted metabolically, but mm. found the phytoplankton more delicious. Yeah, possibly. Next study. Yeah. All right, thank you, Jenny. Next up, we're going to hear from Mackenzie, who is going to talk to us about parasites and periwinkles. Hey, Mackenzie. Can you guys hear me? Oh, hello. My name is Mackenzie Tapley, and today I'm going to be discussing how trematodes influence the motility of the periwinkle species Litterina litterea in Castine, Maine. Cryptocotolingua is a trematode, and a trematode is a parasitic flatworm that um, infects multiple hosts within its lifetime. So the first intermediate host of this trematode is a periwinkle. The trematodes start off as little eggs in the guano of seabirds, and in this example, I'm going to be talking about the herring gull. So when the periwinkle is grazing on algae, it can accidentally ingest some of the guano from a herring gull, and therefore ingest some of the eggs of these trematodes. Inside the periwinkle, the trematodes will infect the hepatopancreas, which is the digestive glands of these periwinkles, and also their gonads. They will develop into redia in these little germinal sacs, and with a temperature cue, they will go on to their next life phase, which is a free swimming state, where they will find a fish and penetrate the skin of the fish and infect them. A herring gull will come down and consume the fish, where the trematode will turn into an adult worm in the gut of the gull. 
There, they will reproduce, lay eggs, and then the gull will defecate, and the life cycle will continue. These, peri um, these treatment toads can have multiple negative health effects on these periwinkles, and that can be a higher, mo higher mortality rate, a lower fecundity, a lower algal consumption rate, and it can also castrate these periwinkles. So all of these effects can allow the algae to overgrow on the beach, and eventually it will bleach and die off, and this can suffocate the beach. So my objective of this study was to um, determine how these trematodes affect the motility of these periwinkles. Uh, previous research has shown that a major indicator of infection is the color of the periwinkle's feet. So I went to Wadsworth Cove Beach and I collected 369 periwinkles and brought them all back to the wet lab. I put them on a glass pane so I could observe the color of their feet. And as you can see here, there are orange footed periwinkles and white footed periwinkles. And the orange color of the periwinkle's feet indicates they're infected with these trematodes. So I separated um, these orange footed periwinkles from the white footed periwinkles and I had 10 of the very vibrant orange colored um, periwinkles and 10 of the very white periwinkles and then the rest of the periwinkles were released. Next, they were all given a, an ID so I could determine which periwinkle was associated with the foot color and the distance that they had traveled. And each periwinkle was put in this uh, flowing seawater table to travel for 15 minutes each. And as you can see from the second picture, there is a mucus trail that is left behind when they travel. So this is what I was using to be able to determine how far that these periwinkles had traveled. And the silt that is on the bottom allows for the mucus trail to be visible. So every time I finished one of the trials, I would clean up the mucus trail and I would stir up the sediment so it could resettle on the bottom and I would be able to have a nice clear path for the next periwinkles. After this, the periwinkles were brought to another lab where I would dissect them. I had to dissect them to be able to determine their infection status. And as you can see here, there is an orange footed periwinkle and I was able to find trematodes. This trematode that is in the video that is playing is already in its free swimming state and it was extracted from this periwinkle, and I had found these trematodes in the hepatopancreas. 80% of the orange-footed periwinkles I did find to be infected with these trematodes, and 100% of the periwinkles that had the white feet were uninfected. The 20% of the periwinkles that were not infected that did have the orange feet could have been because these trematodes are very small and they could have been so scarce that I was unable to find them in these tw this 20% of the orange-footed periwinkles, but there is still the likeliness that these, um, that these periwinkles could have been infected with the trematodes because they had that orange color in their feet. And this is a result from the damage that these trematodes could have caused, releasing pigment into the foot. I found that the orange-footed periwinkles traveled shorter distances than the white-footed periwinkles. The orange-footed periwinkles traveled 27.55 centimeters on average, and the white-footed periwinkles traveled 32.08 centimeters on average. And I did not find a significant difference between these when I ran a t-test through SPSS, and this could have been because I didn't have a high enough statistical power. If I had more individuals, more periwinkles, that I could have measured throughout my experiment, then I could have increased the st statistical power and then had a difference in the orange-footed periwinkles distance versus the white-footed periwinkles distance. I had similar results with the periwinkles that were found to be infected versus uninfected, and the periwinkles that were uninfected had traveled greater distances than the periwinkles that were infected with the trematodes and the periwinkles that were infected only traveled 25.7 centimeters on average, and the periwinkles that were uninfected traveled 32.56 centimeters. Again, when I ran a t-test through SPSS, they didn't have a significant difference, but if I had more individuals, then I could have had a 
significant difference because there is this trend that the periwinkles that are infected travel shorter distances than the periwinkles that are uninfected. So the trematodes damage the hepatopancreas, the digestive glands of these periwinkles, and this can lead to a lower metabolic rate and fewer nutrients getting absorbed. So when the trematodes, especially when they are exiting from this periwinkle to go onto their next host, they cause a lot of damage and throughout the periwinkle's body. So this is holes and rips and tears as they're exiting the hepatopancreas. So with the digestive glands, if there are holes, then there is not as much surface area to be able to absorb the nutrients that these periwinkles are going to need to use for energy. And if they have less energy, then they are going to be moving less than the infected, the uninfected periwinkles. So this can explain how the trematodes are having these negative effects on these, on these periwinkles and causing the infected periwinkles to move shorter distances than the uninfected periwinkles. And I would like to thank my senior research advisor, Professor O'Malley, and my professors, Professor Mullen and Professor Whitney. Thank you. I have one, or I, th I think I had, oh, wait, yes, Pam, save me from having to come up with a question. <laughs> so the trematodes are in seagulls, in snails, and fish. What if we eat the fish that have the trematodes? So Will these trematodes us? are very host specific. So if we eat a fish that is infected with these trematodes, it's likely that they'll just die. Good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my question. Um, could you get a sense of the development or how long the periwinkles had been infected when you did your dissection? I'm just wondering if there's a length of time of infection that maybe gets at why you didn't see a significant result, why you saw the trend, but it wasn't significant. Like, Would that be greater if they had been infected longer or the trend? The parasites were more developed? So I am not quite sure, but I do know that last semester when I was conducting my pilot study, I was finding trematodes that were in the germinal sacs uh, with the redia, so they were not as um, far along in their life cycle, and these ones were in their free swimming state. So it might affect it because I was not able to find the um, parasites in 20% of the orange-footed periwinkles, but possibly if they had a bigger parasite load than I could find them. Okay, next we're going to hear from Alyssa, who studied the vulnerability of casting to sea level rise. Alrighty, so for my senior research, I use geographic information systems to assess coastal vulnerability due to sea level rise in Castine, Maine. So during the 21st century, world sea levels are predicted to rise two meters or more due to global warming. So the main factor contributing to sea level rise is the melting of glaciers and ice sheets, and the second main factor contributing to sea level, sea level rise is thermal expansion, which just means that when water warms up, molecules inside begin to move around faster, therefore expanding the water. So due to their location right on the water, coastal communities are at the greatest risk to the effects of sea level rise. Some impacts that these communities might face include the erosion of beaches, habitat and fauna loss, and flooding, which can uh, lead to damage to homes and other important infrastructure. To determine how vulnerable a community is to sea level rise, a coastal vulnerability assessment needs to be conducted. This type of assessment had not yet been conducted prior to my research, and that's why, well, in Castine, which is why I chose Castine for my study. Um, I was, my main objective for my study was to determine what area or areas were the most vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise. And this would be important for the town to know, just so that they can determine what type of adaptation methods they should implement and where they should implement them. So to complete my assessment, I use seven variables in a coastal vulnerability index, or a CVI, and I used uh, GIS to gather data for four of those variables, and those variables were coastal stability, 
coastal slope and coastal elevation, and distance from shore to road. For my other three variables, I did not need GIS, I, and those variables were uh, mean relative sea level rise, mean tidal range, and mean significant wave height. Now for mean relative sea level rise and mean tidal range, I use the tide gauge in Bar Harbor, Maine. And on the left here, we can see that there is a graph from NOAA, and it's just showing that mean relative sea level rise in Bar Harbor from 1950 to about 2020 was about 2.3 millimeters a year. And I also found that mean tidal range was about 2.78 meters. And so mean significant wave height is defined as the highest one-third of waves over a period of time. So to get that data, the NOAA buoy in Penobscot Bay provided me with mean wave height data. So I took um, the highest one-third of waves from 2021 to 2022, and I just averaged those. And I found that mean significant wave height was about 1.03 meters for Penobscot Bay. So after I had data for all of my variables, and um, I used a coastal vulnerability index, which is seen here on the left, and then a coastal vulnerability equation, which is like on the right. And so basically what this CVI does is it helps uh, make sure that if there are variables that do not have numeric values with them, that I could assign them one. So basically how this works is if I found that a section along Castine had a slope of four degrees, I would then assign it a risk value of four and then plug four in to the equation for A. And then if I found that that same area had a coastal bluff stability that was stable, I would assign that a risk value of two and plug that into the equation for D. Um, and then I would run the equation and obviously I would be provided with a number. And so any values be below 8.7 were considered low risk. Values between 8.7 and 15.6 were considered moderate risk. Values between 15.6 and 20 were considered high risk. And any value above 20 was considered very high risk. So my slope and elevation values actually had standard deviations uh, along with them. So for that, I was able to make a best mean and worst case scenario because I just wanted to cover all of my bases with just providing as much information as possible. So on these maps, uh, green indicates low risk areas, orange indicates moderate risk, yellow indicates um, high risk, and red indicates very high risk. So. We can see in the best case scenario here that almost the entirety of the peninsula of Castine was at low risk except for two main areas which were backshore and then this small portion that is near the wastewater treatment plant but just I'm just going to refer to it as the wastewater treatment plant. And then we get to the mean case scenario and we have about the same thing but now we have the waterfront in the British Canal also showing up as moderate risk. And then we get to the worst case scenario, and now all those areas that were once at low risk are either at high risk, moderate risk, or very high risk. And then backshore in the wastewater treatment plant um, actually went up to very high risk, and then the British Canal and the waterfront went up to high risk. But what does this mean? So basically, I determined that areas that are at uh, moderate risk or more are areas that are more likely to flood and inundate over time. So for that reason, I, decide, or I determined that the four areas most prone to the effects of sea level rise in Castine are the back shore and the wastewater treatment plant for sure, because in each scenario they were at least at moderate risk or more. And then we get to the mean case scenario, and now we are seeing areas such as the waterfront and then the um, British Canal also showing up as moderate risk or more. And then, just for reference again, we have the um, backshore showing up as very high risk, and then we have wastewater treatment plant very high risk, and then we have our waterfront and British Canal that are showing up as high risk. These areas are also really important um, because uh, for socio-economical reasons in Castine, um, especially I think the British Canal being the only road in and out of Castine, it provides a transportation. So what do we do about it? Um, I can't say specifically what I believe the town of Castine should do, but there are many different uh, adaptation methods that coastal communities have already started implementing. Uh, around the world, such as building flood barriers, which can be seen here on the left, or raising homes and other infrastructure, which can be seen here on the right. Um, what each town decides to do is totally going to be different from other towns. It really just depends on a lot of things, but especially cost and convenience. 
And then lastly, so next semester, I actually plan on continuing my research. And I hope to do this in a couple of ways, um, possibly building a tie gauge in Castine, which can be seen here on the left. Um, this would provide more accurate mean relative sea level rise and mean tidal range data for Castine specifically, rather than using the Bar Harbor tie gauge. And uh, hopefully some of my professors will help me out with that one. And then I also hope to gather some qualitative data such as um, by surveying town locals to see um, whether or not their homes have flooded in the past, where they've seen flooding, and um, you know what areas they think are most important for casting and what they would like to see done. That's all. Thank you, Professor Bayer. Thanks, Alyssa. That was really informative. Um, with the different levels of, of risk, um, say your worst case scenario, does that indicate that that might happen sooner or simply that those areas um, will erode faster? Or, um, and, and I guess my second question is, do you have any sense for how sensitive this is to sea level rise, which we know is accelerating. So to answer your first question, um, also another interesting aspect to add to this study would to be see, uh, to see what predictions are for 2050 and 2100 for sea level rise and then add that as well. That would give a better idea um, as to what future predictions are. Um, this was more of a like what's happening currently, but I can't confidently say what would happen in the future. And then can you repeat your second question, because I kind of missed it. Now I have to remember it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Any other questions for Alyssa? All right, nice job, Alyssa. Okay, next we are going to hear from Sarah, who is going to talk to us about uh, measuring pollutants in sediments in our backyard, right in Penobscot Bay. Take it away, Sarah. Okay, Juvie. Um, just making sure. Okay, yeah. Um, so my project was looking at polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, in the sediment in Penobscot Bay. PAHs are a harmful pollutant that's formed via partial, com partial combustion. That can be either natural, so like a forest fire, or it can be uh, anthropogenic, so us running our cars, or lots of manufacturing processes produce PAHs. These PAHs uh, can cause cancer in humans, and we've known that for decades, and because of that, we, uh, PAHs are heavily studied. PAHs can also cause harm in uh, the marine environment. Uh, as you can see here, PAHs have uh, a nonpolar structure. And because of that, they bind to the organic carbon within the marine sediment. Uh, the marine sediment thus has an elevated concentration relative to the water. And because of that, benthic organisms like soles or our, marine, our, or our main lobster uh, are at an elevated risk for PAHs. In 1985, Johnson et al. studied PAHs uh, within the Penobscot Bay. He found that despite how rural Maine was, uh, Penobscot Bay had a surprisingly high concentration of PAHs, comparable even to some areas around Long Island. Um, despite this, there haven't been any published follow-ups on the concentration of PAHs within the bay. So for my study, I tried to, one, uh, figure out what the current PAH concentrations are within the bay, and two, uh, compare those concentrations to 1985 to see uh, if anything's changed. Uh, so Johnson et al. Based, he found that the PAH concentrations were in these um, zones. So it followed a gradient with the north end of the bay being the highest concentration and the south having the lowest concentration. I chose um, 
a site from each of the concentration zones to sample. I went out on the Friendship and used a sediment grab to collect sediment. Um, oh. PAHs, I then extracted my PAHs from the sediment using the ultrasonic method. Basically, I grabbed one gram of, marine, of the marine sediment and used, um, and used meth methylene chloride and hexane, both nonpolar or fairly nonpolar solvents to um, extract my pHs from the sediment. I then concentrated my extracts using the TurboVap, which as Haley mentioned, uses warm water and a flow of nitrogen to evaporate the solvent. I then attempted to purify um, my solvent. The, obviously sediment has more in it than just PAAHs. Um, and so I didn't want to have that in my extract because that would make my results harder to um, measure. And so I used uh, fluorosil, which is um, a polar substance, and I ran through, I ran my solvent through that, and the PAHs, theoretically, uh, we'll get to that later, uh, went through the silica while the um, polar co-extractants would have been stuck in there. And then I had to concentrate my um, extracts again, and then I was finally able to measure them in the GCMS. And then um, when you're comparing, uh, when you're comparing PAHs between sites or across time, people use total organic carbon to, stand, to um, normalize the data because, as I said earlier, PAHs stick to a total organic, to organic carbon, and so sites with higher organic carbon would thus have more PAHs there naturally. Um, so to do that, I used the ignition method. I had wet sediment. I air dried that sediment um, for five to seven days, and then I baked that sediment at 550 degrees for four hours. I then took the weight difference between the air dried sediment and the baked sediment, divided that by 2.5, and that gave me the total organic carbon. <sighs> um, here is my total organic carbon for, the, for each site. I averaged the data, and then the error, error um, bars is the standard deviation. Um, as you can see, um, site two and four um, had, high con had high total organic carbon, so I would expect those two sites to have uh, more PAHs than site one and uh, three. I sadly was not able to get any results from my PAHs. Um, here um, you can see um, these four boxes were my examples of my results. I got from this experiment. Um, ideally, the uh, ideally, when you run your sample through the GCMS, you get clear peaks. Uh, because my I didn't really have clear peaks because it's jaggedy, that indicates that that's like background noise, um, and that means that somewhere in the process. I either never got my PAHs or I lost them. Um, because of the length of time that the study takes, I wasn't able to go back and try to figure that out. So for future studies, I think that, um, so for future studies, you, um, I intend to look at how my extraction of the marine sediment. So I want to purchase uh, a, like a known standard sediment, spike that with PAHs and DPAHs, um, and then extract the sediment using my method. Um, and then that will allow me to know, and then run that through the GCMS with no other steps in between, and see if there's PAHs in that.
Um, and I would like to thank um, my advisor, um, Professor Friedman, um, the OS teachers, um, uh, Mullen and Whitney. Um, I'd also like to thank Pam for managing the lab so well, and um, obviously my lab buddies, um, Milo and Haley and Emma. Who? Kyle, don't talk yet. I'm getting my. It's not a question. It's a statement. Okay. My feelings are hurt that I'm not in the acknowledgement. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kyle. You didn't show up to lab. I have a question. I have a question. You shared your organic carbon data, mm -hmm. and then you hypothesized, and I just can't recall, you hypothesized that where you had the high organic carbon, mm -hmm. you expected to have high PAHs. Right? Yes, Am I saying yes. that? Okay. Uh, does that hypothesis match up with your map where you had in the jo Johnson? Is that right? The yeah, Johnson, Johnson study? Yeah. Does, that, do, does that hypothesis and that organic carbon data match with those zones? Sorry, sorry. I, I, that, was, that was my fault. I misspoke there. I meant that. Um, oh, that's. No, it's a different thing. Um, <laughs> that, that those, that. Yes. <laughs> um, that those. Uh, that the high, I was just kind of restating that the uh, areas with a higher concentration, sorry, with, with a higher total organic carbon percentage um, would accumulate more PAHs from the water, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that like it's being transported there. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was just wondering if it, if it happened to align, then um, it, would, it, it, did, it would be it great. It did align... Um, Site two did have a, it had the second highest um, organic carbon concentration in that, um, sorry, site four had a high total organic carbon concentration, and it is an area that had, that you'd expect to have a lot of PAHs. Cool. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, next we are going to hear from Emily, who will tell us about um, noise pollution and its impacts on hermit crabs. Thanks, Emily. Okay, so my senior research project was on the effect of anthropogenic noise pollution on the behavior of the common hermit crab, Pagurus longicarpus. So when people think of pollution, typically the first thing that comes to mind are things like carbon emissions and oil spills or something along those lines. However, in 1972, anthropogenic noise or human-caused noise became an officially recognized pollutant by the World Health Organization. And according to McDonald et al., anthropogenic noise has been increasing in the ocean by an average of three decibels every decade since the 1960s. Now, since 1972, there have been a multitude of studies done on the effects of noise pollution on different marine organisms, but they mostly focus on marine mammals and other charismatic vertebrates. So much less is known about invertebrate species. So the map on the left shows shipping traffic density across the world, where the red colors show those higher, traffics of densi or higher densities of traffic. And as you can see, a lot of the red is localized around the coasts. So hermit crabs are among those coastal invertebrate species that could be potentially negatively impacted by harmful levels of noise pollution. But why do we care? Well, hermit crabs are ecologically important to the intertidal zone as they work to effectively recycle nutrients back into their environments as scavengers. They're also relatively abundant and observable. Now, that being said, they can potentially serve as a good indicator species for those harmful levels of noise pollution. And while hermit crabs don't have the traditional ears like we do, they do have their own unique way of hearing and processing sound in their environment. All over their bodies are these tiny cutic cuticular hairs that work to detect even the smallest of vibrations in the water, like sound waves. So my study aimed to investigate the more general question, how does noise pollution impact the behavior of the hermit crab? And this is an ethogram that I formulated for my study 
that describes the five basic behaviors that I focused on during my investigation. And those behaviors are stationary, retracted, burrowing, eating, and walking. The methods of my study included collecting hermit crabs from our back shore and housing them at Andrew's laboratory at the waterfront. I then sectioned off a flow-through seawater table with some plexiglass to make a smaller arena, and I filled that arena with about three centimeters of sand, just to allow burrowing to take place should any hermit crab decide to burrow. And in order to minimize the effect of my presence on the behavior of the hermit crabs, I used a GoPro camera that was hanging in this wire basket directly above the arena to record each of the trials. Seven hermit crabs were tested individually in 20 minute periods where the first 10 minutes was reserved for a control period where I didn't introduce any extra noise. They were just exposed to the ambient noise in the wet lab. And for the final 10 minutes, I used this underwater speaker to play my noise treatment, which was a single tone of 200 hertz at approximately 90 decibels. These are two short clips of some of the behaviors that I noticed during my trials. So this is a hermit crab burrowing. And this is a hermit crab eating. <laughs> so the data that I extrapolated from each of the recordings was in the percent time that hermit crabs spent performing these behaviors in both the control and the noise treatment periods. Now because this data was in percents, before I could do any stats on it, I first needed to transform it using an arcsine transformation function. But from there, I was able to run a series of paired t-tests to determine if there was a significance in the amount of time hermit crabs spent performing these behaviors in the control versus the noise treatment periods. So this is a figure from my results where it shows the average percent time spent performing each behavior on the y-axis and the behavior type on the x-axis. And you'll also note that the blue columns are the control period and the green columns are the noise period. So overall, I found that there wasn't a significant difference in the amount of time that hermit crabs spent performing behaviors in either period. However, I did notice some general trends that was consistent for the majority of my hermit crabs. For example, four of the seven hermit crabs that I tested showed a decrease in walking behaviors during the noise treatment periods. And similarly, four of the seven hermit crabs showed an increase in burrowing behaviors during the noise treatment period. So when diving into similar literature, I found that my study didn't replicate the results of other investigations. And for example, in 2019, Tijua and Briffa investigated the impacts of shipping noise on the common European hermit crab, Pergurus bernhardus, that you see on the left. Now, they found they did find significant results when they subjected these hermit crabs to playbacks or recordings of shipping noise. They used six different recordings of playbacks or, or playbacks of shipping noise, and they, found, and they also played their noise at a decibel level of 119 decibels, where I only played mine at approximately 90. So after subjecting these hermit crabs to shipping noise, they found that there was a decrease in social behaviors or a grouping behavior, and there was a significant decrease in shell decision making, meaning that the hermit crabs were struggling to find and identify shells that were best suited for them in their environments. Now, a similar study done in 2016 by Nausk McGregor and Mai also looked at the impacts of noise pollution on the common hermit crab, Pagurus bernhardus, and they too found that there were significant results when they subjected hermit crabs to true playback of shipping noise. They found that after subjecting their hermit crabs to noise, there was a significant decrease in anti-predator defense, meaning that hermit crabs were taking longer to see and respond to predators being in their area. And as you can see in the graph on the left, they show that the response latency increases during the noise treatments in the boat and shipping uh, noise playbacks. So it's important to note that both of these studies used real playbacks of shipping noise as their sound treatment, whereas in my study, I used just a single tone of 200 hertz. This distinction in methodology is important, as I believe that it could mean that hermit crabs in my studies were just not affected by a single tone, whereas in other studies, when they were subjected to true playbacks of shipping noise with all the varying, varying frequencies and decibels, that was more of a nuisance for them and caused significant results. And similar studies have been done on other members of the crustacean subphylum, like prawn and spiny lobster, and they too found 
significant impacts on their behavior when subjected to shipping noise. Now, I believe that it would be beneficial in the future to replicate these studies using real playbacks of shipping noise as the sound treatments. I also believe that it would be beneficial to play these sound treatments at altering decibel levels to determine if there is a threshold of sound level that starts to significantly impact the behavior of these organisms. I believe that this study opens up avenues for further investigations and also helps our understanding of how noise pollution impacts coastal marine invertebrates. Thank you. Questions for Emily? One, I think, as we try to come up with it on the fly. How, remind me again how long your, your exposures were, your noise, like your experiments. So each treatment period was just 10 minutes long. Other studies show, or other studies did between 10 and 20 minutes also. My original goal was to shoot for 20 minutes of noise treatment, but unfortunately my camera just couldn't handle being on for that long and would overheat and die, so I had to chop it in half. But, yeah. Yeah, you can kind of see where I'm going. I'm just wondering how important do you think the time component is? I think that at, at a certain point, it would probably plateau. Mm -hmm. So as long as they're initially, like, shocked with this change in um, sound in their environment and they have a couple minutes to kind of acclimate, after that, I kind of think it plateaus and you can kind of get a sense of their impacts. Did you find anything where it... Like, or, animals do seem to truly like just get used. I just think about the real world and they're kind of just exposed to noise pollution mm -hmm. all the time. Do you, have you read anything that looks like they do kind of truly acclimate to, to, the, to the noise pollution? In my research, I didn't find anything that suggested that animals were adapting and um, becoming used to noise pollution. All I found was these horrible effects of prolonged exposure, so. Cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Come on down, Ben. All right. Next, we are going to hear from Ben, who is going to um, talk to us about the. I'm trying to summarize without reading your your uh, title. <laughs> yeah, the stress response of sea cucumbers to their predator, a predator, sea sea stars. There. I'll let you tell it in the fancy way. Thank you. Still working? Yes. Okay. So, the topic of my research project was the anticipatory anti-predator behaviors of Cucumaria frondosa in response to chemical cues from Asterius rubens. So, this is Cucumaria frondosa. It is a species of benthic filter-feeding sea cucumber that's native to the North Atlantic, including here in the Gulf of Maine. They're not very impressive. The are the target of an active fishery here in the Gulf of Maine. It's small, but it is still active. This chart is from the Maine Department of Marine Resources, and it displays landing data for the species from 1964 up to 2021. The x-axis is just time over the years. The y-axis on the left is the weight of these uh, annual catches in millions of pounds, and the y-axis on the right is the value of these in millions of dollars. And you can see that value displayed by the red line has displayed an increasing trend over time as uh, demand has increased in foreign markets where these are shipped off to. Cucumaria frondosa is a species that has an acute chemosensory organ lining its body wall. This allows it to detect changes in the chemistry of its environment, uh, including temperature, salinity, or presence of other organisms through their chemical cues. This is a graph from a study by Hamel et al. with a group of researchers in Newfoundland that observed the immune cell aggregate count of Cucumaria frondosa when exposed to chemical cues from their primary predator, the northern sun star, also known as Celaster endica. You can see that they display an increasing trend in immune cell aggregate count uh, in their body wall over the course of about three hours of exposure. This is a proxy for stress in sea, uh, sea cucumbers. It's a stress response they display in anticipation, anticipation of an attack from a predator. Stress over time, even without an attack from a predator, if prolonged, can become damaging to the sea cucumber's health. This 
is Asterius rubens. It's a common sea star. They're all over the place here in Castine, and they are another known predator of Cucumaria frondosa. Though their relationship is not as well understood in terms of predation as with Celaster endica, the sun star. That one is a known to be a primary predator of the species. This one, A. rubens, is very infrequent. Recordings of it aren't common, and the drivers behind predation uh, of this starfish on sea cucumbers is not well understood. And neither is the effect of its chemical cues on their stress. So uh, for my research project, a, I had a pair of divers collect around 60 sea cucumbers from beneath the MMA pier, and after sorting through them to find all conspecifics of a similar size and uh, seemed healthy, I acclimated them in a seawater table for about five days before setting up these, uh, this experimental table with six different tanks. Each tank has seawater input flowing into it and uh, air pumps to aerate the water. Half of these have a, one individual of C. frondosa and one caged A. rubens, and the other half all contain the individual C. frondosa and an empty cage as a control. These were dispersed randomly throughout the tank so that environmental biases didn't interfere with my results. I would have these exposures to a caged A. rubens last for about three hours, well, exactly three hours, and they would be recorded overhead the entire time with a time-lapse camera, a Brino TLC 200. Then I took these recordings of their behavior and I used a set of behavioral stress scoring criteria developed by those researchers from earlier, Hamel et al., which allows you to look at the behaviors displayed by the sea cucumber and from that you can analyze its stress. These are some examples of behaviors that I observed and stress scores to go along with them. So at the top left is a relaxed sea cucumber. It's not inflated. It's sticking itself to the substrate that it's attached to and its feeding tentacles have been extended. Bottom left is a 0.5 on the scale. It is slightly bloated. It's still attached to its substrate, but its tentacles have been retracted. Top right is about a 1.0. The sea cucumber is moving itself off of its substrate, and it is actually slowly crawling around the tank. And I didn't observe any instances of a 2.0 that I could show you, so I'll show you a 3.0, which is the highest stress value on this scale. These sea cucumbers are displaying active buoyancy adjustment, which is they have filled their bodies with seawater to inflate themselves, increase their buoyancy, and make themselves appear larger, and they have detached themselves from their substrate. So zero is no stress, one is low stress, two is mid stress, three is high stress. When I took all these uh, behavioral scores that I observed uh, over the course of time in these experiments and averaged them out between the treatments, the orange is the sea star exposed group and the blue is the control, I found that the sea star exposed group had an average behavioral score which was five times higher than the score of the control. It should be noted though that none of my observations were of any behaviors higher than a 1.0 during testing, which means that all the behaviors I observed were low stress behaviors. You can see here the x-axis is time, one value for every five minutes, and the y-axis is the average behavioral score observed. I got that with a Man whitney u test, which is also how I uh, used to differentiate between the amount of time that sea cucumbers would spend performing specific behaviors uh, when, they're, when they are or are not exposed to these CQ, uh, sea star chemical cues. Particularly, I looked at how much time they spent either sedentary or crawling around, and I looked at how much time that these groups spent with their feeding tentacles extended versus retracted. Uh, I did not find a significant difference between the sedentary versus crawling between these two groups, but I did find that the sea cucumbers in the sea star exposed group spent an average of 41% less time with their feeding tentacles extended than those that were in the control group. And then I used a repeated measures ANOVA to uh, look for changes in average behavioral stress over the course of the experiment within treatments. So this is still blue control, orange for the sea star group. Uh, each bar that shares a letter with another bar is not significantly different from that bar. So you can see that over the course of the experiment, looked at uh, once every 30 minutes, you can see that the control group displayed no changes in the average behavioral stress score, whereas the sea cucumber group, the, excuse me, the ones that were exposed to the sea star, decreased their average behavioral stress score by 50% after three hours of continued exposure. When you take the results of my study using Asterius rubens, that, that mysterious predator with an infrequent uh, predatory relationship with the sea cucumber, and you compare it to the study I derived my methods from, Hamel et al., which once again used the northern sun star, which is a primary predator of the sea star, 
you can see that there's a big, a big difference in the stress scores observed. Hamel et al. and highlighted in red is the contactless exposure to the sun star. After about three hours of treatment, their average behavioral stress score was at 2.0. Mine was closer to 0.2. So this species is considered a higher priority threat by the sea cucumber, and it exhibits more stress in its presence. Both my study and Hamel also observe evidence of habituation, which is that over the course of the study, the sea cucumber starts decreasing its stress while the exposure is still ongoing. It's becoming accustomed to the presence of this chemical cue in the water. Uh, mine, you, and as stated previously, the average behavioral stress score decreased by half over the course of three hours. In the instance of Hamel et al., this took three days for it to uh, drop to a level that was similar to baseline. So this suggests overall that Asterius rubens is not a significant stressor on the, uh, the chemical presence of Asterius rubens is not a significant stressor on Cucumaria frondosa, as suggested by low overall scores across the board when exposed to the chemical cues and a very rapid habituation. Okay, thank you. I would like to thank uh, Professor Verdi, my advisor, everybody who helped me with my paper, which is like most of the people in this room, and Emily and Verdi for helping collect them from underneath the dock. Ben, questions? We are running a little ahead of schedule, so you, you, have, you have time for a few questions. Questions for Ben? All right. Well, I do. Okay, great. What does, it, what does it mean for the cucumber fishery? How do, how does your, how do your results interface with the cucumber fishery? So because the stress that uh, Cucumaria frondosa experiences, if extended over a longer period of time, can affect its health, this directly affects the health of the fishery as well as the quality of the sea cucumbers that are collected as a product. So if, if say, if Asterius rubens exhibited really, really high uh, stress responses in Cucumaria frondosa, that would have been one more thing that could contribute in addition to changing climates and fishing pressures, contributing to a lower quality of health in the organisms themselves. But the fact that this is not observed suggests otherwise that it's not really a significant factor. I have a, you were alluding to the question that I was going to ask, but if it's not this sea star, what do you think the greatest threat to the cucumber industry is? Looking at other papers that I observed, they do exhibit a very high stress response to changes in salinity and changes in temperature. So over time, of course, climate change is probably what will do them in if nothing is done. But aside from that, the lack of any regulations on their current fishery is also a contender. That's why it's being monitored, is because other fisheries of sea cucumbers in similar circumstances have become endangered. This has not happened to sea frondosa yet, but without regulation, that could be its future. Thank you. Ah, come on, I'm like, where is she? All right, Kat is going to talk to us about the effects of diesel fuel on garden peas. Thank you. Okay, yep, so I'm gonna be talking about the effect of diesel fuel as a soil contaminant on both the growth and the chlorophyll A concentration of green garden peas, also known as Pissum sativum. Okay, so over 100 gallons of diesel fuel are spilled every single year. When diesel fuel gets into the soil, it can have immediate and long-lasting effects on the plants in that area and that soil community. Diesel fuel is able to stay in the soil for over five years at a time. In a study done by Merkel et al. in 2005, on um, tropical legumes, they found that in contaminated samples, the overall biomass produced was less than that of non-contaminated samples. So this chart right here, the white bars are the um, non-contaminated samples and the gray bars are the contaminated samples. Um, this chart right here shows the overall uh, shoot dry weight uh, over days and then the root dry weight. So when diesel fuel gets into the soil, it is transported by groundwater. So the groundwater will be sucked up through the roots of plants, and that can be very harmful to the plants, obviously. Um, but most plants, especially legumes, are equipped with 
microorganisms known as symbol symbi soil symbionts on their roots. Uh, what soil symbionts do is they detoxify the contaminants in the soil via a process known as bioremediation. So because of the bioremediation process that uh, legumes go through, it, that is why I picked uh, green peas as my species to be using for my study. And what I did was I wanted to determine if there was a significant difference in, or there was a significant impact on the growth and chlorophyll A concentration of these peas. So the two questions that I posed was first uh, referring to the growth and the growth rate. I wanted to know if there would be a significant difference in the overall growth and growth rate of these peas if I put them under three different conditions. Um, and under those same three conditions, I wanted to see if the chlorophyll A concentration would be significantly different. So in order to do this, I had to make my... Um, my different conditions. I had three of them and each condition had four pots um, with a certain number of plants per pot. It depended on what condition it was. So each pot was able to hold 24 ounces of soil. Uh, the first group that I created was an uncontaminated sample. Uh, each pot, this is just an example of what one of those four pots would look like. So the uncontaminated sample just had the 24 ounces of potting soil with two seeds planted per pot. The next group that I had had 4.5 milliliters of diesel fuel uh, put into the soil and then two plants planted per pot. And then the last group was also contaminated with 4.5 milliliters of diesel fuel, but this group had four plants per pot. I chose these parameters because I was curious to see if the higher density of plants, therefore a higher density of the soil symbionts uh, present in the roots, would increase the rate of bioremediation and therefore increase success of those plants. So uh, twice a week I would go in take measurements of those plants, water them, and also look at the coloration of the plants, the um, leaf, leaf development, and I would also check for the presence of diesel fumes in the um, growth chamber. Uh, at week four, there was enough plant tissue for me to grab a sample, a leaf sample from every single plant. I bagged them, brought them up to the botany lab in Rogers, and created uh, chlorophyll extraction samples. The way that I did that was each leaf was individually ground up with five milliliters of 90% acetone. It was then placed into a clear cuvette and immediately wrapped in tinfoil to keep any light from hitting the sample and degrading the chlorophyll I was trying to extract. Um, after 24 hours in a refrigerator, I knew that all of my chlorophyll was extracted, and I then put my samples in a fluorometer, which is pictured right here, to get a reading, and it would spit out a reading to me in micrograms of chlorophyll A per liter. So regarding growth, uh, the peas were able to grow in all three of the conditions. The control, cold control group um, had 100% success um, and getting to the mature state. Um, only two of the plants in the contaminated group with two plants per pot um, did not reach maturity, and only one plant in the contaminated group with four plants per pot did not reach maturity. So these images right here show week one, right after planting of all three of the samples, all the way to the last week of growth, week six. So I completed three Kruskal Wallace A. Nova statistical analyses to answer my proposed research questions. And the first thing that I found was that um, there was a decrease in overall plant height in the groups that contaminate, were contaminated with diesel. So this chart right here shows time in days on the x-axis and on the y-axis I have plant height in centimeters. This blue line um, represents the control group which clearly has the highest overall growth um, which is then followed by the contaminated group with four plants per pot. And lastly the orange line showing the least amount of overall growth, the contaminated group with two plants per pot. 
Uh, considering growth rate, there was no um, statistical difference or statistically significant difference in the growth rate, but visually it looks like the um, diesel contaminated groups had a higher growth rate. Um, when talking about my chlorophyll A concentrations that I gathered, there was also not a statistically significant difference. The blue bars represent the week four um, samples that I gathered. The orange bars represent the week six samples I gathered. Um, the week six samples basically had zero difference in um, chlorophyll concentration among them, but the blue bars had a little bit with the um, the diesel contaminated groups. Uh, the results for growth were uh, aligned with literature in a um, experiment done by Zarin Kumar. They found that um, as diesel fuel concentration increase, overall growth of um, tall fescue decreased. So these blue bars represent the root length and the red dots represent leaf length. When talking about chlorophyll, um, my results did not really go with literature. In this uh, experiment here by Jury et al., uh, the P for polluted and NP for non-polluted, uh, you can see that the chlorophyll A content was less in the polluted and 70.3% more in the non-polluted. And I just want to thank everyone that uh, helped me with my research, especially Professor O'Malley, Professor Whitney, Professor Mullen, and my entire class. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Uh, questions? Professor Langford? I don't need a microphone. I've got a big mouth. Okay. <laughs> we'll so see what Brian your, has to say about that. Growth per time curves, mm -hmm. your contaminated two plants seem to be really accelerating at the end. One in my appraisal. Did you see that? No, you, you're correct. And um, I'm not sure. I wish, honestly, I could have uh, grown for at least eight weeks because towards the end, if you look... Um, Right here, the two contaminated groups actually cross and kind of right. are switching up. So I really, I really wish that I could have seen it through for longer. Uh, I, like, like you said, the diesel contaminated with two plants began to really pick up um, its growth rate. Okay. Um, I'm curious as to why. I wasn't really sure, but stuff exactly, stuff does happen. <laughs> Thank you. India. So you mentioned that only a um, certain amount of plants reach maturity. What defines maturity in a pea plant? Yeah, so um, at the within the first two weeks of growing, um, the seedlings were still alive, but barely above the soil. Um, after, once I got to about week three, they just died off and shriveled up. So maturity was... Basically, they died, <laughs> so they did not make it. Uh, jumping off of that, and so you obviously have a time restraint on yeah. your study. In the other studies you've read, is there a long-term effect? Yeah, I read a couple on, of studies that went all the way to five years, and um, I, I definitely did not have five years. I would have liked maybe like eight to 10 weeks. Like that was something that I talked about that I would have done differently. I also probably would have increased the concentration of diesel fuel um, just because I had such a short amount of time. But the biggest thing I wanted to do was not kill everything. So I, I went on the safe side with the 4.5 milliliters. But if I had to do it again, I'd probably go to five or 5.5. One more. Mm -hmm. I feel like it might be an obvious answer, but uh, with contaminated samples, are they actually edible? Had oh my gosh. studies? I would not eat it. But then again, um, I pulled from real world problems. And like I said, over 100 gallons of diesel fuel are spilled and it gets moved very quickly through the soil. So, I mean, who knows if we've already eaten it. But they didn't um, bear any, uh, any like pods yet. That doesn't usually happen until week eight or week 10 of growth. All right. 
Thank you, Kat. Next, we're going to hear from Milo, who will talk to us about carbon and nitrogen in marine sediments. For my senior research project, I studied the ratio of carbon to nitrogen in marine sediments in Penobscot Bay, Maine, particularly on a little transect off of Pond Island. As you may have heard, the global atmospheric carbon dioxide is increasing steadily with time. Over the last 20 years, according to a study done by Gruber, it has increased by about 12%, and of that, 30% has been absorbed by the oceans. This diagram on the left is showing a short-term ecological kind of nutrient cycle, but it includes carbon dioxide. And I know I said I'm studying carbon, not carbon dioxide, but carbon dioxide is an input of carbon. That phytoplankton and zooplankton use and produce it, as well as bacteria and other envi or organisms that live in the benthic environment. And then on the right hand side is a long term biogeochemical view of this nutrient cycle. And that blob kind of just represents that it's being buried and stored in the sediment for a longer period of time. This is another diagram showing carbon flow throughout the oceans and a lot of the carbon, you know, if you believe it, about 1.2 gigatons of carbon per year are put into the sediments and buried deeper and deeper into the sediments. The sediments are a great, marine sediments particularly, are a great source of carbon and nutrient storage, but a lot of climate models aren't including marine sediments today when they're doing their global carbon budgets, trying to calculate how much like excess carbon we can handle. And it'll be important to understand how the sediments will be affected because there are particular nutrient ratios that matter to marine organisms such as phytoplankton and bacteria, like the red field ratio, which is carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus. And these organisms rely on these ratios to survive. They can indicate their cellular structure and their metabolism. And if these ratios are changing within the cells or within the environment, it can ultimately impact their physiology, which would cause them to die. We don't really want the bottom of our food chain dying. To do this, I collected sediment using a sediment grab, which is shown on the left side here. Some sediments were also collected using a shovel by hand. Once I had my sediments collected, I split them up to be air dried so that I wouldn't be burning off any organic matter or other nutrients. And then the other sediments were put in the oven because they were just going through a grain size analysis. The oven dried sediments I put in a sediment shaker, which is a bunch of like mesh sieves stacked on top of each other and it shakes, I did it for about five minutes. And they shook through and you get the sediment separated out into its appropriate grain sizes. The other method that I used for the kind of muddier, denser, clay sediments is the pipette method that apparatus shown in the middle. It's like the finest mesh sieve you can get. You wash your sediment through it into a huge graduated cylinder and then you stir it up pretty vigorously. And using Stokes settling law, you can calculate the settling rate of the particles, which will give you their grain size in the end. Once I had my grain sizes, I used a Walkley black titration to measure the carbon content in the sediments. In the titration, carbon is reduced and oxidized to be proportional to the amount of potassium dichromate. And the methods that I used following a paper written by Nilo in 2019 give an equation to be able to calculate the carbon. Lastly, I did a Keldahl digestion. The digestion block and digestion tubes are all shown on that far picture. It gets super, super hot and digests the samples. I also ran some standards with known concentrations of ammonium nitrogen so that I would have a baseline. And with those, I made a standard curve in the spectrophotometer and then applied my samples to that and was able to calculate how much nitrogen was in each of my samples. Once I had all of my data, I put it all into Excel and ran a series of F tests and T tests. I did the F tests to determine if I should be doing a T test assuming equal variances or unequal variances and I found that I should be doing all of my t-tests assuming unequal variances. On the
screen graph here is my nitrogen contents in millimolar units. The smallest grain sizes are on the left side and the largest are on the other side. The blue graph is carbon also in millimolar. Um, they look pretty similar, but they're not because this, the nitrogen, the y-axis starts at 6.4 and ends at 7.3. But on the carbon graph, it goes from 0 to 100. So on the next slide, I have them side by side on the same axis so you can see it a little bit better. But I did my t-tests between carbon and nitrogen, carbon and grain size, and nitrogen and grain size, and I only found a significant relationship between carbon and nitrogen. That graph on the right-hand side is the carbon in blue and the nitrogen in green, all, both in millimolar on the same scale. And this one on the left is kind of an orangish color, is the ratio of carbon to nitrogen, again with grain size. I didn't, didn't do any statistical analyses on the ratio itself because of the way Excel does the math for the t-test, it did not like it. Um, for, I didn't expect to find that there would be this many nutrients, or this, I expected there to be more nutrients in these smaller grain sediments because they don't allow as much water to flow through them, which would wash away nutrients. I expected it to be higher nutrients there and lower nutrients sandy sediments that have larger grains, but it is possible from my research that there are types of bacteria that only live on sand grains due to the minerals in sand that don't exist in clay that could be contributing to additional nutrients in the larger grain sediments, and those would be, those would probably live around Pond Island where there's a pond full of organic matter right in the middle of the island. I think that if a further study were to be done, they should consider using much smaller grain sizes. Most of the studies I looked at, their largest grain size was the smallest one I found. And I also think that other methods for using, or measuring carbon and nitrogen could be used because the methods I used were typically used for soils and were from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. But something like a stable isotope analysis might be more appropriate for marine sediments. Kyle, question? Okay. So I know that like we were talking outside of class and we talked about how much nutrients that these sediments can actually store in. And you said that you didn't know why if these sediments could store so much nutrients, they still weren't considered like a source of carbon sink. Do you think in the future, maybe further research could provide an answer for that? And maybe it will get recognized as a source for a carbon sink later on? Yeah, I think that as people continue to do more and more research on marine sediments and their ability to kind of stabilize nutrient ratios and things, it'll become more prevalent. Do you think it's pe necessary for people to do the grain size analysis in order to get at that point? Um, not necessarily. I had looked at grain size because different grain sizes have different abilities to hold nutrients, but I didn't find a significant Other questions for Milo? All right, thank you, Milo. All right, next we're gonna hear from India who looked at historical CTD data in Penobscot River. Hi, my name's India Namer. I did my study on analyzing s historical CTD data in the Penobscot River from 1993 to 2001. So as you've heard many times throughout these presentations and throughout the news and everything, the Gulf of Maine is warming significantly faster than most bodies of water around the world. While there's a lot of studies done on the Gulf of Maine, there's not as many done on the Penobscot River. Uh, the Penobscot River ends up feeding into the Gulf of Maine, which when I was doing my initial research, I was kind of shocked to find how many studies are not focused on long-term uh, temperature data analysis on the Penobscot River. A lot of it's focusing on metals and organisms, but not temperature. And this is important because 
even though the Penobscot may not have a massive contribute to the temperature in the Gulf of Maine, uh, there are many fisheries and local communities that rely on the Penobscot River for everyday just use. So I focus my study locations on three stations. Uh, we, I found that there are, uh, we took a class back in freshman year of the ocean studies where it's intro to oceanography, used to be called intro to marine science, where towards the end of the semester, we would go and do a day cruise to go and collect uh, water samples for uh, chlorophyll, oxygen, and CTD data. We've been doing this since at least 1993, and I was able to get a hold of all the CTD data and found that the best locations for my study were to focus on stations one and two and three, since they had the most uh, consistent info. There are some years that were skipped and some years that uh, do, did different stations. But uh, when I went and when I went and put all the the data together, I was able to create a uh, Excel sheet. Eventually, after using all of the data points that I found, uh, it took me a while as the data points were saved in multiple different formats over the years. The one on the left is 1993, and the one on the right is 1996. Uh, the, these two were saved in these, uh, I'm trying to think of how to describe them. They're saved in like plotted forms, plotted graphs already. The later studies and later um, data research, they were saved in the like raw data forms, so you can look at individual points at individual uh, heights or depths. So, uh, yeah, they, they were saved different ways, which made it a little confusing going to study it through it all because I had to use different, uh, just like, slightly different methods to make sure that I have the accurate info related to the data that I was pulling it from. When I did the analysis, I did the uh, Mann-Kendall test, which is a non-parametric uh, test, and I actually found that within my study, uh, the temperature did not have a significant change, but uh, salinity did. So. Uh, the yeah. So over the years that I studied from the uh, 1993 to 2001, there was no uh, temperature change, or there was temperature change but no significant within the study, within the analysis, which was very confusing to me because if you base off the studies for everything else done from the Gulf of Maine, you see that over the years with the climate change, there is a increase, at least a significant one. Uh, but I then went further into my study and de decided to split the uh, temperature into uh, the different tidal stages. So I looked at the ebbing tide and the flooding tide, separated the groups out into uh, what's the, f the tidal stage that they were going through. And I found that they did have a much higher uh, significant change, which also got me a little confused just because we see the increase, especially in the flooding tide, but in the ebbing tide, we see a significant decrease. I still haven't <laughs> uh, been able to figure out why this happened, but uh, seeing that there is a significance within this data uh, does, I'm trying to think how to explain it. it, it I have more hope for uh, possible future analysis of this data. So I mentioned earlier how it was a little odd uh, for me to see that they didn't, there was no significant uh, change within, if you, when you look at the 
analysis side of the uh, research, there was a positive increase in temperature over time. Just within my study, the points were a little too scattered. Uh, I think it's mostly because the uh, a lot of other studies either have are are able to go through data that's way back into the 80s and sometimes 70s, or they have a continuous data stream throughout the entire year. I focused on one data point per year, pretty much, uh, as there are some years that only had one data and some years that had up to three data points. But if I included all those together, it uh, I'd have to take the average of some, but it would have been, it would have got a little more confusing if I included them all. But a lot of other studies, like the Salisbury and, and Johnson, they studied theirs over multiple years, uh, way back before the 80s, and their focus was in the average of like the entire Gulf of Maine. And so I believe that's partly why the, my research showed uh, insignificant just in with the temperature just because the so few data points it makes it a little bit more confusing uh, or a little bit more chaotic and random just within the temperature study but for future studies there's still a lot of stuff that I didn't do within just my research there's, uh, like I said earlier, we also studied the chlorophyll content and oxygen levels. Uh, so throughout those years, there's oxygen and such that we didn't look at. There's also different depths because I only studied the first two meters. And I hope for future studies that we can follow more uniform format to allow a better continuous study of this research within the next years. India? Pam. So India, do you think that maybe weather may have had a factor in some of those cruises? Because I've been here almost that length of time, and the weather <laughs> has varied from cruise to cruise. Yes. Uh, something I actually forgot to mention. Uh, with the temperature, um, especially. I did look at uh, how like the air temperature was and uh, precipitation what levels were, uh, including the last precipitation for the last two days, because since I was looking at surface temperature, it uh, the surface, yeah, I'm trying to think. I did look at how it could affect the, the water temperature and when I was doing the uh, the water temperature on the charts, I did put air temperature to see if there was a, a significant amount uh, or if there was a correlation between the two. And I found that there wasn't that much of a correlation between air temperature and water temperature at the study at the time, which is also something that it would be interesting to look at going on to see because uh, I had to rely on other sources looking at the air temperature rather than maybe people at the at the site also looking at the air temperature at the time because the air temperature place is like miles away from where the study is other questions for india all right thank you india Last, right? Last but not least, Courtney's going to talk to us about the effects of sound on sugar kelp. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Perfect. 
Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Courtney King, and today I am presenting on the effect of sound frequency on the growth of saccharine latissima, more commonly known as sugar kelp. So just a little bit of background on why I did my study. We have all heard today that anthropogenic sound is a increasing area of study due to it being a recognized noise pollutant, both in marine environments and terrestrial. And there have been studies done that have shown that terrestrial plants do in fact respond to sounds in their environment and also to set frequencies within laboratory experiments. So this is from one of the papers that I was looking at throughout my study. And this is from a laboratory experiment that looked at different types of terrestrial plants and how they responded to sonication with acoustic sound or sonication with ultrasound. And it kind of just mapped out the results that they saw with different species of terrestrial plants. And basically, throughout this whole paper, and mapping out the results, they found that almost all of these terrestrial plants responded with alterations in growth and development. And so after reading all these papers, I decided that I would try and look and see how a marine algae could respond to sound in its environment, and looking closer into anthropogenic sound, because as we all know, it's a noise pollutant. So for my study, um, I was looking at two different objectives. So the first one was, is there a significant difference in kelp punch diameter between sound and control treatments? And then the second objective was, is there a relationship between growth of kelp punches and type of sound frequency? So for my methodology, for my experiment, I did this all down at the waterfront in Andrews Hall, flowing seawater lab. I first started off by collecting 10 blades of kelp off the Maine Maritime Academy waterfront docks, and I got similarly sized blades of kelp as much as I could. And then I took them back to the flowing seawater table where they were kept when they weren't in their sound treatments. And so for subsampling, I took three punches, which were 21 millimeters in diameter, and I used that little copper hole punch tool. And I took three punches per kelp blade, so I had 30 punches in total, and each one of these punches was then sorted into a specific sound treatment group. So there was one punch per blade in each one of my sound treatments. And I had three different sound treatments, one being high frequency, one being low frequency, and then I had the control group. And so for my sound treatments, I had made a light emitting, noise reducing sound treatment box, which was just a 10 gallon aquarium that I put soundproofing foam around to make light a non-variable in this process. And then to also try and emit any sort of outside sounds from the lab getting into the sound treatment box during their trials. And so within the sound treatment box, I took the samples from, well, I would do one sound frequency at a time. And then I would take the samples and put them into little mesh containment bags, which actually sank the samples to the bottom of the aquarium. So I could haphazardly place them in that formation. And they were underneath the underwater speaker that I used. I used the same one Emily did. And the speaker was suspended at the top of the tank, so the sound waves were emitted down onto my samples each time. And so for my frequencies that I used, I used an online tone generator to just have a set frequency playing. And I chose two different sound frequencies to use. So my high frequency was set at 15,000 hertz, which was based off a calculation that I had done during my pilot study which I was comparing the diameter of my kelp punches to the length of a sound wave to try and see what the optimal wavelength would be to stimulate growth of my kelp. So that's how I got that sound frequency. And then my low sound frequency I had set at 500 hertz, and that was to kind of simulate any frequencies that are produced by shipping vessels within the oceans. And so for those two frequencies, I would play them for two hour duration for four days a week for three weeks in total. And then my control group also would be placed into these tanks, but were just subjected to no sound during that time. And so for my data analysis, I collected data twice a week. I did the beginning of the week and then the end of the week for three weeks in total. So I got six measurement periods overall. And there are my 30 samples right there with all their measurement periods. So that's my whole data set that I collected. And then once my data was in Excel, I could then tr transport it over to RStudio to conduct data analysis using R code. 
I ran a normality test and a variance test, which then revealed that my data was non-parametric. So then I decided to use a Criscoll Wallace ANOVA test, also in R code. And that revealed that there was no significant difference in kelp punch diameter between each sound treatment group. So even though my data was non-significant, I still did see trends of growth throughout the study. So here on this graph on the y-axis is the average diameter of my kelp punches in millimeters, and that was for each sound treatment group, as you can see in the legend up there. And then on the x-axis is just each measurement date that they were taken. And as you can see, all my punches did grow, um, and while they were growing, they also started to get some outliers in each group, which then caused my standard deviation to grow as well. So this is some more trends from my data. So on this graph, this shows the kelp punch growth that was the overall, so that's T final minus T initial. And then there you can see each of my sound treatment groups on the bottom there. And so these trends correlate with research that I had been looking at that was done on terrestrial plants and how sound frequencies can stimulate growth for those. And so my trends do correlate with that, but unfortunately I did not have a large enough sample size or long enough duration of the study to determine if my results were actually significant. But I do believe that if someone else was to carry on this research that they could produce significant results with a larger sample size and a couple more weeks of sound trials. And then lastly, I would just like to thank Pam Grindle for helping us with all of our lab supplies. Um, she got me all of my speakers and everything. I would like to thank Professor Mullen, who is my advisor, who did an awesome job keeping me grounded throughout this whole process, and Professor Whitney for reading all of our paragraphs in class and getting us such helpful feedback. And then I would also like to thank every single one of my classmates. You guys all helped in your own individual way to get me through this process. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> so, don't. Haley. So this is kind of going with like a question from like Emily's um, project as well. Like, do you think varying sound frequencies, like if you tested your plants with that, if that would affect growth, like changing the tone or something? Yeah, so I chose to just do a set sound frequency because that is what all the um, tests on terrestrial plants had looked at, but I do think if someone was to carry this study on and look at um, kind of the significance of anthropogenic noise pollution, that they would need to do some varying frequency tests. Um, but for this one, I just use a set frequency. I can't remember if you said this or not, but do you think there would have been a difference if you had done this test like similar to your pilot study um, during their ideal growth season? Do you think that would have impacted it as yeah. well? Yeah, so I definitely would have seen more growth and my samples would have lasted a little bit longer. I had to kind of stick to the three week period because that is as long as I could keep my samples from disintegrating. <laughs> After about three weeks, they would just, the tissue would start to disintegrate so I couldn't get a solid measurement anymore. But um, yeah, I do believe if this study was done during their ideal growth season, you would see vastly different results. I have a question. Noise pollution has a negative connotation associated with it, but yet you're seeing an increase in growth. So is it a good thing for some, for some species, the noise pollution? So that's, that's a tricky question because I, again, only used the set frequency, which has been shown to increase growth, but um, I cannot determine at this time if kind of a varying frequency due to like shipping vessels and stuff would have a negative connotation towards their growth. Did you see or read about that in the terrestrial world? Were there negative impacts of noise pollution on plant growth? Um, yes, there were some species that either didn't have an impact or some species that um, they compared like high frequency to low frequency. And the low frequency definitely did, um, like looking at like flowering on plants, like would produce less flowers on a plant than a high frequency. Great. Oh, sorry. Wait, was bear. there another one? Oh, ask it. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Um, 
do you think uh, with the growth of aquaculture in Maine that this is a, a viable way to, um, like, could you commercialize this to increase the growth rate of, of aquaculture? Yeah, um, great question. I, I think that this could be used in, like, kelp nurseries where they're kind of in a controlled environment where you could produce sound on a smaller scale level. Um, but once they're out in the field, like out on kelp farms, I don't think it would be quite as applicable, but definitely within the nurseries. It's like a lullaby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a round of applause for everyone. Nice job, everybody. Yeah, so uh, students don't leave, would like to get a picture. And then an, an announcement for anyone who's left in the room that isn't one of our students. Um, there are, these students will also be presenting the work in a poster format next week at this time um, from two to four in ABS. So stop on by and then you can have um, some conversations with them about the work that they're doing directly. So I encourage everyone to come back for that next week. All right, thank you everyone. Let's get...